Well, today we're going to continue, however, on an important topic we've been dealing with. It's really a prayer series, and uh, today I want to invite you to take out your worship guide. Inside of that guide, there are a set of notes that are there, and we encourage you to look along with them, with me rather, and um, uh, we encourage you to engage with that. It'll make a great difference today. All our visitors, welcome today. We are so glad that you are here and would love the opportunity to greet you personally after service. In your notes, it says that today's subtitle is The Search Engine. The Search Engine. How many of you know what a search engine is? Come on, if you're alive in 2018, you know what a search engine is. And how many of you would agree, who would agree with me, that today we live in an instantaneous information society? Come on, is that true? Who, who would agree with that? That w Today, if you need knowledge, you need information about virtually anything there is to know about, you can get it instantly, right? You can search it right away. And we do that through something that we call the search engine. In fact, uh, I mean, just for kicks, and we've all done this, but I, I did this just to really reinforce this idea in my own heart, uh, this, this message. I, I, I actually use the search engine to see on purpose what, what does it provide for me if I search uh, knowledge out in some area. And uh, it's amazing what I found, and I'm sure you found it too if you've paid close attention to it. But our opening verse today in this message called The Search Engine is called to me, Jeremiah 33 and 3, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Now this is an amazing statement because we live and an instantaneous knowledge, instantaneous information society. If you want information on anything, all you have to do is, come on, Google it. And Google has already prepared some pages for you. They've already done some gathering of knowledge and gathering of information for you so that all that you would have to do is go to your phone, go to your laptop, go to your tablet, whatever the device, and simply put a word in. What do I need? How do I know more about this? Or tell me more about that, and it will give you pages and pages of information that they have already searched. But what I find interesting is this, is that Jeremiah says, call to me, God is saying to him, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and what kind of things? Unsearchable things that you do not know. So what God is telling us is there are some things that are what? unsearchable. You cannot find the answer on earth to some of the things that we need an answer to. But you know, Google can do pretty good, can it? In fact, I did. you can experiment with this in your own time. I mean, try the same uh, uh, searches that, I, that I'm going to mention and see what it brings up in your own, uh, on your own uh, time here. In fact, I think on a laptop, it'll even tell you the number of pages and how long it took to do this. So here's what I did. I looked up, what is marriage about? I just put that inside of Google, and you know what Google said in 0.46 seconds? It opened up the page, and it said that there are about 570 million individual pages under the topic, what is marriage about? Come on, how many know that's a lot of pages? How many of you know that? Who would agree that's a lot of information? That is a lot of knowledge. I looked up, I just put this phrase in, the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And in 0.52 seconds, it said that, sir, there are about 328 million pages of information about the Pacific Ocean. And then, and then uh, getting out of debt, getting out of debt. And once again, about the same time, and hundreds of millions of pages of information. In fact, in a March 2013 article said that Google said that there were about, this is 2013, Google said then that there were about 30 trillion individual pages of information on the web. How many know that's just a lot of information? Come on, it would take us a lifetime to count to 30 trillion. And yet there are some things that Google cannot answer. How many know that? 
In fact, here's your, here's your first right in. The, the, the knowledge that we obtain via the Internet, right, it, it, it can answer a lot of questions, but only one person can answer the question that matters most in life. Only one person. And that person that we're talking about today is a person who dwells within us if you are born again. And he is the person called Holy Spirit. See, he's the only one that can answer questions that are unsearchable. When God said unsearchable, he didn't mean unanswerable. He just means that there is no answer that comes from man that will provide you the solution to the question that you have. And so Google and Internet can answer a lot of questions, but they're just some questions that are too personal to you. They're too specific to your life for any man to have exact knowledge on what you should do. Questions like, should I take this job that I can get today that'll start paying me today? Or should I hold out for another month? Not knowing that in another month, there's a job that will pay you twice that with greater benefits. Right? Uh, should, should, should we buy this house or should we buy that house? My son, my daughter, they are prepared for college and they even have money set aside. Should we send them to this school or should we send them to that school? Right? Ladies, you might ask, should I go out to dinner with this man? Come on, don't get quiet on me now. Huh? I mean, there are all kinds of questions. God, what is your purpose for my life? Come on, Google can't answer that for you. The Internet can't handle that question. Come on, I, I, I've been trying to kick this habit for 27 years. I've read everything, gone to every seminar, taken everything, and it still hasn't kicked it. God, what do I need to do to kick this habit? The Internet may have all kinds of suggestions, but they don't give you the power in order to do it. But see, there is one who can answer that, and that is the person of the Holy Spirit, and that's who we're talking about. In fact, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 9 and 10. See, our lives are full of questions. Our lives are full of questions, and there's only one person who can answer those questions that really matter the most. In fact, here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 and 10. The NIV says it this way. He says, however, as it is written, what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no human mind has conceived... The things that God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. Well, the spirit searches how many things? Come on, how many things does the spirit of God search? All things. Come on, what does all mean? All means everything. Everything. And he says, even the what? The deep things of God. So here we have with us, he says, the Holy Spirit searches all things and he even searches the deep things of God. So although there are some things that are unsearchable, the Holy Spirit can search even those. Now just think about this. If mankind, fallen humanity, can create a system that can give you 570 million pages of information about any topic that you put in and not make you wait even a minute to start searching. How much more is the God of the universe and the Holy Spirit himself, who is God, able to answer the questions that you put in his search engine? In fact, Google got their idea from God. <laughs> Because the Holy Spirit himself is the greatest search engine that there ever was. You see, this search engine is a person and he knows no limit on what he can search. Wherever there's a question in our life, Holy Spirit has the answer. Come on, we can't possibly think that the God who knows everything will be outdone by man who is limited in his knowledge. So if we're, so, so there are a lot of questions. How I many you know a lot of questions like that in our lives that are very personal that we need answers to? 
And what I submit to you as we continue in this line thinking about our prayer lives and what God wants to do in our lives is we need to avail ourselves to the great search engine of the Godhead and he is Holy Spirit. We don't have to be ignorant about any area of our lives if we will yield and give ourselves to partner with the Holy Spirit and allow him to show us what it is that we need answers to. Amen? Amen. That's who he is. He is the great search engine of God. And, and of course, we all have questions in our lives. And, and I want us to look at this next verse. It's uh, Mark chapter, uh, rather Colossians chapter 3. And as we go there, uh, I want us to think about this next statement. That as a son of God, son of course means a son or daughter. How many of you are a child of God? Jesus is Lord in your life. God lives in your heart by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that you are a son of God. Son is refers to a position. It's not so much talking about gender. So women and men are sons of God, which means we are the heirs of God. So as a son or daughter of God, here's what we need to appreciate. My real identity and your real identity and purpose is hidden in Christ. And it is revealed as you and I seek him. See, what I love about that verse and that we just read in Corinthians is that means that there are some things that God has prepared for us that nobody even knows about. You see, what most, what, once you become a Christian, once you become saved, them or born again, you, you enter the family of God. God becomes your father. Jesus makes you righteous. You become part of God's family. But once we become part of God's family, from that moment on, our life is on a quest and on a journey. And the issue is this, how much can my life be fruitful and used for God's glory? That's what being a Christian is about. It's not even, a, it's not about many of the, listen, we do a lot of things in the name of Jesus that are cool, that are good, watch this, and that are even biblical and right. But we must never miss the main point. The main point of our life as a Christian is how much can my life bear fruit for him? How much can my life help others? How much can my life bless others? How much can God use me to show the love of Jesus Christ, the heart of God to my world? How much can my life make a difference for Jesus Christ in this world? Some things may be big and seem sensational. Some things may be big and you may be well known. Others may live their entire lives and not be known by many, but their lives will count amazingly for Jesus Christ because they found out their purpose and they made a difference where they are. You see, once you're a Christian, friend, what it is about is now how can I live the rest of my life to please God? Because God is a rewarder of those that please him. It's interesting the Bible tells us that we are in a race. How many of you have ever heard terms like this? Let us, let us keep our eyes on Jesus and run the race that is set before us. Paul said in one place, he says, I have, I have finished my course, right? He says, I fought a good fight. I've, I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept my faith. One another place, Paul says that we should run the race and run that we might win. Win. And the reason that the Christian life is called a race uses that as a metaphor because we're not in competition with anybody else, but we're on a course and on a journey. And the journey is that they, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, want to see is how much of your life will we get fruit out? How much fruit will we get out of your life? All right. How much, how much will you allow your, uh, us to use your life to bring us glory? And all throughout that, Jesus talks about that we'll be rewarded for the life that we live for him. See, one of the things I think it's very important not to miss as Christians is to not miss the big picture. How many know that somebody in a marathon is not running for pleasure? Come on, you don't run 26 miles for pleasure. Come on, you might, it might be pleasurable to you if you're an athlete, but if you're running a marathon, you're actually in a race. How many of you know that? And you are running to win. And oftentimes, I think we get so busy in life 
So busy with things and school and work and shopping and vacation and duties and responsibility that sometimes we miss the big picture. And that is we are running a race and the whole goal of our life, watch this, is not to have a good job, get married, have three awesome children and eight amazing grandchildren, be prosperous, have an amazing job, no debt, be, uh, do all of those things, but miss the real reason why we're here. All of those things are awesome, they're good, they're biblical, and if God has his way, we will walk in all of them. That's just not the point of your life. You say it's not, Pastor? Oh, no. But we've emphasized it so much, but that's not the point of your life. The point of your life is how much did my life please God? Because, in other words, was I faithful to what he told me to do? Did I love others as he loved me? All right. Was I obedient to the assignment that he placed me on the earth to do? You see, you are you are born again because of what Jesus has done for you. But you are rewarded eternally for how you live for him. And so therefore, the big picture is, am I is my life counting for Jesus Christ? And in order for that to happen, we've got to have some answers. We, we got to know, Lord, why am I even here in the first place? All right. And so we don't want to, to miss the big picture. So here's what this next writing says. As a son of God, your real identity and purpose is hidden in Christ and it is revealed as you seek him. Colossians chapter three in verse three says this. For as far as this world is concerned, you have what? Died. And your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. So he says, now that we're born again, he says, you have died as far as this world is concerned. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So I wanted to open this message up and we're just going to share for a few minutes today about this whole idea of how important it is to have an ongoing life of seeking God. See, if you think about it, we're used to seeking information all the time. Nowadays, you don't even need a physical paper map to go anywhere around town, or around the world. Somebody says, uh, I need you to go over here. I need you to go to this place. In fact, all you need is the name of the place now. You put the name of the place, put it in your computer, your tablet, whatever, and what does it do? Tells you the information, tells you the phone number, tells you maybe who the owners are, when the place started, what kind of food they serve, what their hobbies are, and everything else. Right? With just one click of the button, we are used to searching information. But friends, I want to help guide us to this point. Are, Are we searching the one who has real answers for our lives? And are we searching after the things that matter most? Because we don't want to get so caught up in living in the busyness of life that we miss the main thing. Because you see what will really matter most because we're all going to stand before him. And that's not a morbid, scary thing. That's a thing that sobers us. And we're all going to stand before him. What will really matter most is how much did my life count for him? Praise God. So therefore, we need to be people who are always seeking after him. Now, this is amazing to me. Verse 3 says this. He says, For as far as the world is concerned, you've died, and your new what? Real life is hidden with Christ in God. So that tells us that my real life, my real identity, who I really am, what I'm really about, is hidden in Christ with God. That's your real life. Say it out loud, my real life. My real real identity said this way, what I'm really about. Where is it at? It's it's hidden. Where? In Christ. So watch this. If my real life, what I'm really about, what really matters about me, if it's hidden, that means everything that you can judge and see about yourself and others through the natural has nothing to do with your real life. Your age has nothing to do with your real life. What side of the tracks you grew up on has nada, nothing, zilch to do with your real life. Your current uh, income statement 
has nothing to do with your real life. What happened to you when you were six has nothing to do with your real life. Because as far as this world is concerned, you are dead and you're the old you. The old man on the inside. Yes, you're alive and have an address and a social security number and went to this school and have graduation papers and work there tomorrow. Yes, you're here. But as far as the world is concerned, your old life, you have died. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, if it's hidden in Christ in God, with Christ in God, that means it is not on the surface. Because how many know things that are hidden are not in plain sight? So that means what you are really about is not in plain sight. It's hidden. Oh, uh, we're just reading, come on, we're just reading the Bible, aren't we? So if it's hidden, that means the only way you can know what you're really about is you're going to have to search for what is not on the surface. And if you never search for what is beyond the surface, you will live your entire Christian life born again, loving the Lord, having good times here and there, but never really knowing what your real life is about. You can deal with all kinds of depression because you never know what your life is really about. Because you're judging yourself by something that has nothing to do with your real life. Oh, this will set you free. That's all it'll do if you meditate on it. It'll, it'll deliver you right here. You're all upset. You're all crushed. You're all concerned and, and bent out of shape about things that have nothing to do with your real life. Oh, they may be things that matter and have a place and they have an importance. Maybe some areas of our life that we need to get together. But they don't have to do with who you actually are and what your life is actually about. Your real life is hidden. So if my real life is hidden and I never search it, then what life am I living? Come on, if there's a real life, that the word real, you can look up hundreds of synonyms for this, but one of them would be actual. So my actual life, what I'm actually about is hidden in Christ so that I would search it out and find out what I'm really about and start living out of that. But if I never search beyond the surface, if I'm only born again, if I only come to church, watch this, every week, and serve, and give, and shout hallelujah, and do all things, but I never search beyond the surface. I'll live my whole life and have never really lived who I was really supposed to be. This is a challenge in church. This is one of the areas of the church that God is calling us up to. This is why he gave us Holy Spirit. Part of the reason why he gave us Holy Spirit, part of what it means to be spirit filled in the aspects and some of the details that we talk about in being spirit filled in our prayer language is not for the point of the prayer language. It's for the leading to a greater point, And that is for discovering and searching who we really are so that the life that has been hidden beyond the surface in Christ can come out and we can be who God has called us to be. That's what the journey is all about. That's why once you're born again, now it's about getting your search engine out. Getting on the search and finding out what am I really about? Who am I really? Who am I really? Who am I really? What am I really? And as we as individuals do that, man, you're going to find more joy, more power, more strength. You're going to find out what your life is really about. And it will make the difference. Praise God. All right. That's on the side there. You guys can find that on the side side stage there. Thank you. So so watch this now. He says you are dead and your true life is hidden with Christ in God. Mark chapter four, verse 22. We're going to look at the NIV Mark four twenty two. Now, as I said this last week, if you're going to get along good with God, it's just some things you have to know about. I mean, if you're going to get along with someone, you need to know some things about them. Amen. Well, here's what you need to know about the Lord. The Lord likes mystery. He likes mystery. But his mystery game, thank you, is not hide and seek. It's actually seek and find. Amen. That's right. 
God doesn't play hide and seek. He plays seek and find. But he does like mystery. Because, because he, he, he likes mystery because mystery causes us to pursue him. He want, he's a God who wants to be pursued, not because he's insecure and needy. Amen. He wants to be pursued because in the pursuit is it changes us and we discover who we really are and what we're really about. And so God, you will see the word mystery. Just, just do a search of the word mystery in the New Testament and you'd be amazed to see how much it appears. But here's what's deep about mystery. God does not hide things from us. He hides them for us. Come on, say it this way. God never hides things from me. He hides things for me. This is, watch this in the scripture. Verse 22, Mark 4, 22, NIV. Let's read it together. Ready, read. Is hidden, is meant to be disclosed. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. Do you see that? Say, say we just, we're just reading the Bible. That's all we're doing. Listen to that. Whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. And whatever is concealed, according to Jesus, and I think he knows pretty good about this, it's meant to be brought out into the open. Going back to the verse before, don't turn there, but just think about it. It's right there in your notes. Your real life is hidden in Christ. But wait a minute. Whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. And whatever is concealed is meant to be what? Brought out into the open. But if we don't search, we won't find. So what you're really about is hidden in Christ. And it's meant for us to search and go after. And the more you search and go after, the more you will find out individually what your real life is about. Amen. Amen. Your real life is hidden in him. And whatever is concealed, that is amazing. So that means apparently the reason God hid it was for us to discover it. Because it was meant to be revealed. Praise God. That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. So, so when you're spending time seeking God, when, and I, I challenge you, whatever your prayer time was, and, and we, through the, during the 21 days, we challenge you to take it up. But how many know we're past the 21 days? But how many know what we're talking about is not about 21 days? Come on, this is about a lifestyle. Wouldn't you love to know all the stuff about your real life? Come on, if you can search Google and find out 500 million pages about the Pacific Ocean, wouldn't it be a whole lot more profitable to find 500,000 million pages of information about your real life and who you really are in Christ? Yes. So you know what the issue is in the church? Most of the church is never living there, are never really in their real life. Yes. Most of us have lived, will live and die. I, I, I don't, I, let me say it this way. Most people have lived and died as Christians and never experience their real life. So if there's a real life, there's a fake one. Wonder if because of a lack of searching, the life we're living was never meant to be what we're supposed to be experiencing. But yet if we'll search, we'll find out our real life. Come on, how many know when you know the real truth, it changes how you act, doesn't it? Absolutely. Because watch this. Let me show you an example of this. There's a man named Saul. He was in the Old Testament. In fact, he was the first king of Israel. Now, there's a long story about his life. It's a, it's a great study in Bible characters. It's a great study about obedience and humility. There's a lot of things we can learn from the life of the first king of Israel. But as we go to 1 Samuel chapter 9, we're only going to look at a few verses in chapter 9, around verses 18, 19, 20, 21, right in there. But let me set up the context. And that is this, is that Israel was surrounded by many nations. This is in the earlier years of God uh, dealing with them and, and, and being the head over their lives as a nation of people, as the descendants of Abraham. 
And uh, around all of them were many nations that had kings as their leader. They had a political king, a political person in power as the leader of their nation. And uh, as a whole, as a nation, they did not really have a good handle as a hold on who God was to them, on all that he meant for them to be, and all that they were to him, and, and that they really were the apple of his eye. But you see, they didn't really know who they really were to him. And because of that, uh, they, were, they were a bit insecure, or I'll say it this way, they were open to a sense of a competition and feelings of being wanting to be like other people and comparing themselves with others. They didn't think they were as hot to trot because they didn't have a king over their nation. And eventually they just couldn't take it anymore. And uh, there was a leader, God put spiritual leaders in place to help give them guidance and communicate his heart to them. At that time, uh, the main leader at that time of the people of Israel were prophets or judges. And one of them was named Samuel. And his part of his role was to help give people God's word and help call his people to closeness and faithfulness to God's heart. Well, they cried out and said, we, we want a king. We want a king like everybody else. You see, anytime we don't know who we really are to God, it opens us up to compare ourselves with others because we're not really sure about who we really are. And, and that's why Jesus, again, Paul said by the Holy Spirit, your real life is hidden with Christ. So the whole thing is not to be looking around and comparing our lives with others. The real life is to get into the search engine called Holy Spirit so that he can reveal to us our real life that is hidden beyond the surface that is meant to be revealed. So they cried and cried. Samuel knew better. He said, this is not your will, God. I did. They shouldn't have a king, a king that's going to mess up things and, you know, mess up their peace and really take more of their income out of their house than they need and all this kind of thing. And eventually God said, listen, don't get offended. Don't be hurt, Samuel. It's not you. It's me. They got some heart issues, but don't worry about it. I'm going to give them what they asked for. And eventually he told him, here's your guy, his name is Saul, gave him a description so that he would know by the spirit exactly who the man was. And sure enough, he, he, this happened. He directed him there. Meanwhile, in the meanwhile, everyone say in the meanwhile. In the meanwhile, in the meanwhile this young man named Saul was, uh, uh, had, had uh, his father's donkeys had been misplaced. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. And later he would say that of the 12 tribes, and of the 12 tribes, not only was that the smallest, but his family was the least significant tribe in the smallest tribe of Israel. So he didn't really think a whole lot about himself. And one day his father's donkeys were lost, and he was looking for them and searching for them, and, and he couldn't find them. And after a while, he said, well, man, man, this is, this is getting too much. We need some help here. And they, in the conversation, he said, well, you know, there's a prophet there uh, in, 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 uh, down, downtown. And if we'll go downtown and ask him, well, then maybe he can tell us where my father's donkeys are. He said, what's his name? His name is Samuel. Well, let's, let's get on our way. Let's get to him. So finally, they come to eventually to Samuel's uh, place where he is, and they get into this conversation. Now remember, God told Samuel that Saul is to be the first king of Israel. You're to speak over these words in his life. You're to anoint him with oil, and I have called him to be the first king of Israel. And even though it wasn't God's plan for Israel to have a king that way, God would still, if Saul had done what God told him to do, God would still bless Saul and so forth. So here's what happened. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 18, we pick up here. It says, Then Saul drew near to Samuel, the prophet, in the gate. And he said, Please tell me, where is the seer's house? They called prophets seers because they, would, they, they were very prolific in visions. They had visions all the time. Verse 19, Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go and will tell you, come on, what's the rest of that verse say? All that is in your heart. 
Now that's interesting. Because what is Saul looking for when he comes to see Samuel? Come on, everyone say donkeys. That's what he's looking for, right? He comes and finds him. Yes, I'm the prophet. I'm the seer that you're asking about. And tomorrow you're going to eat with me and we're going to have this big dinner and you're going to be the guest of honor and you're going to sit with me and I'm going to talk to you after that's over and I'm going to tell you everything that is in your heart. He's like, what? And well, he keeps going. The next verse says this. Um, he says, and don't worry about those donkeys, verse 20 and 21. Don't worry about those donkeys that were lost three days ago, for they have been found. And I am here to tell you that you and your family are the focus of all of Israel's hopes. What? Man, I just came to ask you about some donkeys. Now, what is this about Israel and the hopes? What, what's going on here? And then Samuel says, Saul. Saul said, but I'm only from the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribe in Israel, and my family is the least important of all of the families of that tribe. Why are you talking to me like this? What are you talking about? What do you mean all of Israel's hope? Well, here's what happened. He didn't even know what God had already planned for him. Samuel knew, but Saul didn't. So now watch this. Samuel knows the word of God, he knows the will of God. He knows at least a part of Saul's destiny. Why? Because God told him. But here is Saul, who's actually the king of Israel and doesn't even know it. In fact, he's not even trying to know it. He's not even interested in the position. All the man is looking for is his daddy's donkeys. If he can get his daddy's donkeys and get home tonight, he would be happy. And yet, he's a king of Israel and doesn't know it. Now, what I find interesting is Samuel's language. He says, you're going to eat with me, and then later I'm going to tell you everything that is in your heart. Which means in his heart was a kingship. What was on the inside of him was a kingship, but it was hidden to Saul. You see, there are things that are on the inside of you in Christ that are in your heart. You don't even know it. Samuel, because they didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within, and mostly the word of God came through seers and prophets and would come sometime upon a person in an atmosphere of worship or the king himself, especially a righteous king. That's how the word of God came. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. So Samuel represented, in a sense, the voice of the Holy Spirit who was telling Saul what was on the inside. So what happened the next day? You can read it later. The next day, sure enough, they have this big dinner. They go up to this big fancy restaurant at this big place. And I mean, all these important people, the leaders of Israel are there. And Saul is there. And they're like, what is all of this? He says, sit down at the place of honor. And he sits down at the place of honor. And then they said, go get the best cut of meat that was prepared for the person of honor. And Samuel said, I've, I've saved the best piece and it's waiting for the guest of honor and that's your place. Sit right here. You are the, you're the guest of honor. Saul has no idea what's going on. You know why? Because he doesn't know what's in his heart. You see, many times we don't know what's in our heart. Your real life is where? Hidden with Christ in God. It takes the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what is down there on the inside. What is it that you have never walked in yet that's down in your heart that you don't even know? Or what is it that you know a little bit about, but you have no idea how to get from A to Z? But see, the Holy Spirit knows, and he wants to tell you. He wants to help you. And that's why when we begin to search Search for him. In fact, there's four things. This, none of this is in your notes, but this will help you. There are four things, really, that once you're a Christian, we're to always be seeking. 
There are four things that we're to always be seeking lifetime, no matter how much answers you're walking in, prosperity, peace, relationship, doesn't matter any of those things. There's still four things we're to always be seeking. Number one, we're to be seeking his face, seeking his strength always. That's 1 Chronicles 16, 11. He says, seek his face, seek his strength or his face forevermore. In other words, that's the father always seeking his heart and his strength. The, the next thing is we always need to be seeking who, learning more about the person of Jesus Christ. Who he really is more and more. That's why Paul said, I pray that God give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. We're to always be seeking him. John 17, 3 says this. You can write these down. He says, this is eternal life, that they know you, Father, and that they know Jesus, me, the one whom you sent. That's, what he, that's where eternal life is, 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 is in knowing him. What's the third thing we ought to be seeking always? Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added. In other words, what pleases God? What adds to his kingdom? What makes my life a blessing for him? Seeking him all the time. And then number four, the fourth thing we should be seeking, and we just read it earlier, it's Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. You can read them later. It says, since you are raised up with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affairs. Affections on things above, not on things beneath. Say, what, you, what, what is that about, Pastor? Again, once I'm a Christian, the, the lot of my energy needs to be in those four areas of seeking. Why? Because that's what's going to matter ultimately. That's what's going to matter. Come on, that's, that's what's really going to matter. It, it's how much of my life did I live for him? I know in church we talk about a lot of things, and I know a lot of things have our attention. But I tell you, uh, one of the things that's important for myself and others who stand in my positions as pastors is to also teach the body of Christ how to not only have one eye on living well here, but one eye on eternity. Amen. Remember the demonstration of the long, long rope that we gave? <laughs> How many of you were here to remember that? You, you saw that. And we had a little red tip at the top of the rope. And then we had like 250 feet of rope all around this auditorium. And you know what the red tip on the rope represented? Come on, tell me if you remember. Life. Your life here. And you know what the rest of the rope represented? Eternity. See, so what really matters, and look up, it'd be amazing to see how much the word talks about reward. Right? Because God wants to see what really matters is how much that I live for him and, and the reward that I have because of how I live. And therefore, these four areas of searching will help us to live most with the most fruit that we can have in our lives. That's why we want to be searching those four things always. All right. So listen, when you pray in the spirit, and we've talked about praying in the spirit, praying in your heavenly prayer language. Praying in other tongues, in particular, when you pray that way, there is a greater uh, capacity, there's a greater power in your seeking when you are praying that way. We can pray in the understanding, but praying that way has an even greater effect and impact in these four areas. In fact, here's your next write in. When you pray in the Spirit, you access and download. Hidden knowledge. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, the New King James says it this way. It says, he, he that prayeth or speaketh in a tongue speaks not unto who? Men, but unto God. For no one understands him However, in the spirit, he speaks what? He speaks mysteries. So when we're praying in our heavenly prayer language, he is saying we are speaking mysteries or divine secrets. Why? Because the plan of God for your life, your family, is so intelligent, is so high, it's at such a level that you and I don't even have the intellect to even know what to pray out, even if we had an idea of what it was. 
So God in his ingenious and his sophistication and the technology that they operate with at heaven installed a language in us that enables us to bypass our ignorance in our gray matter between our ears and still be able to communicate with heaven the plan and purposes of God. You say, well, how is that helping you? How, how am I praying out mysteries? Well, first of all, remember this. There is no mystery to God. How many know God has never learned anything? Who would agree with me? Amen. Right? So when you are praying in your heavenly prayer language, you have to understand you are not praying a, a language that you made up. It's a language of the spirit. And it is a language. It's just not a language of men. Remember, every language that we learn, we made this one up down here. You do realize every language we have, we made up. God didn't. I hate to break this to you. Hold on. Hold on. You ready for this? When you get to heaven, hang on. You ready? The official language is not English. It's not English. It's not Spanish. It's not Portuguese. It's, it's not even Hebrew. The official language is a language of the spirit that we won't, you don't even know. But we'll know by the spirit. Folks, every language that we got, God didn't copying us. He, we made this stuff up. So he's not incorporating what we made up into his realm. So in other words, when we're communicating our heavenly language, that's the language of the spirit, heart to heart, pure and unadulterated from you to the father. And when you are praying in the spirit, you are not only communicating out, but you are also downloading what hidden knowledge on the inside. All right. Now watch this. Stay with me now. This will help us. Stay with me. All right. So first Psalm 40, verse five. Let's move. Psalm 40 in verse five. Psalm 40, verse 5. It says, Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be counted to you in order. If I were to declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Wow. God has a lot of thoughts. Come on, look at somebody. Say, God has a lot of thoughts toward you. Say, say it this way. God is thinking a lot about you. Okay, again, how many know we're just reading the Bible? The Bible says God has many thoughts. David says, if I was to count them, they could not be numbered. And he goes on to say this. He says, listen, they are, they are more than can be numbered. Other translations say they are more than the sands on the sea. That means God has a lot of thoughts about you. And how many, how many know that, he, that to be thinking means to be calculating? He's thinking about you. He's calculating things about you. He's thinking about you more than you're thinking about you. So what's happening, you see, when we are praying in the Holy Spirit or praying in our heavenly prayer language, you're also accessing the thoughts of God. Amen. What thoughts? The thoughts that he has about you. So when I'm praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit is going into the, he's a search engine. He's going into the heart of God and he begins to pull up just like you pull up information on Google. Holy Spirit pulls up information from the heart of God about your life. Right? And what happens, you're not only communicating out, you're also downloading information. I know I'm sounding technical, maybe too technical on a Sunday morning, but this matters. Listen to this. How many know when you send an email, how many have sent an email out recently? Who would agree with me that when you send an email out in probably 99% of the cases, you also retain a copy of it? Even if you don't CC yourself, your email server retains a copy of what you set out. And it saves it in a file called the, see you guys, you understand this, you're flowing with me. Which means what you actually set out is still on your server. Isn't it? So when you are praying in tongues, you are communicating out a language, but guess where it's still stored? On your server called your spirit. That's cool, Pastor, but I still don't understand it. No problem. Guess where Holy Spirit lives? 
you're one spirit with him. Guess who does know everything? Holy Spirit. So when you're praying in other tongues, you're not only praying out, but you're also downloading whatever God would have said if he was in your place praying to him himself. And it's now stored on the inside. And now by and by, as you're going, as you're shopping, as you're doing mundane things like washing the dishes and vacuuming, by and by, maybe you're in a time of worship. Maybe while you're hearing the word, just like this, in all sorts of situations, the Holy Spirit will begin to take what you have had downloaded on the inside of you and is now on your server called your human spirit and now begins to disclose what you prayed out. Because there's no mystery to the Godhead. They know everything. They even know what you didn't have enough intelligence to download and pray out, but they know it. And now as you're needing it, they're starting to unfold it to you. So you can point your server in any direction and begin to pray in the spirit in that area. And you'll begin to pray out the mind of God concerning you in that area. Now, because you're praying in the spirit, sometimes the Holy Spirit will use that to pray about somebody's salvation and getting delivered from a bank robbery 280 miles away from you because he's efficient that way. But then, but then he can also be using you to pray about that particular area that you're praying about. This is the mystery of praying in the spirit. And it's powerful. And I'm telling you, like I said, if I'm Satan, I'm bringing up all kind of confusion on this one. I'm shutting this one right here down. Because if these jokers get a hold to this and start operating in this and start discovering their real life that is hidden in Christ, I'm shut down in their area. So let's parade as much confusion about it as possible. Let's make it seem unsophisticated and weird and spooky and strange. Let's, let's even use good men and good women to, to you know, I mean, to, to you know, to, to have to say, man, that is not for us. It's wrong to think that way. And, and let's confuse the church in that area because it's so powerful. Right. So that's what's happening when we're praying in the spirit. And we need to wrap this up. You can look at Jeremiah 29 later. Here's the point. Here's your last write in on this page. Your friendship with the Holy Spirit will turn you into an overcomer. Amen. Your friendship with the Holy Spirit will turn you into an overcomer. The second Corinthians 13, 14, he says, may the may the the grace of the Lord Jesus. Right. May the love of God and may the what communion or fellowship. Of the Holy Spirit be with you when be with you all notice this grace of Jesus love of God and fellowship what is fellowship friendship it's friendship this is the more we're friends with the Holy Spirit the more he reveals to us that's what this whole and we say this all the time it's about relationship so the greatest thing that we can do as Christians as believers, as followers of Jesus, is develop friendship with the Holy Spirit. That's where it's at, folks. That's where the power is. I thought about this song as we're, we're preparing to, to end this message today just for time's sake. I was thinking about this song. And the, the, I think it was the second one. Man, it really hit me today more than any other time because I, I guess because of what I was sharing today. It's amazing what it said. Listen to the words. I think Israel Holton wrote this. He Maybe him and someone else together. But it says this. What does it mean to be saved? Listen to this. Isn't it more than just a prayer to pray? Isn't it more than just a way to heaven? And he's, he's not answering the question, but he's asking the question, and the assumed answer is a resounding... Oh, that wasn't loud enough. Let me try this again. What does it mean to be saved? Is it being saved more than a prayer we pray? Yes. Is it being saved more than just a way to heaven? Yes. yes. What does it mean to be his? What does it mean to be his? What does it really mean? See, that's hidden in Christ. And you can't get it. Watch this, even just from a sermon that I preach. No pastor was ever, ever, ever meant to fulfill the need of what you have spiritually as an individual. Ever, ever, never, ever, 
ever. The best preacher, teacher, expositor, prophet, evangelist, apostle, teacher, whatever in the planet cannot meet your individual spiritual needs. Are you listening to me? This is a pastor telling you this. Because no pastor is better than the Holy Spirit. No pastor can search the unsearchable depths of God for your life. And part of the church, we've become way too dependent. Hear me now. This is a pastor teaching you this. On a man. To be our, this is not a thing where we're like little baby birds in the nest. And every Sunday for mama to feed us what she has eaten and regurgitated and given back to you. That's all right for birds. And it's all right for babies. But at some point along the way, we have to grow up and start feeding and eating ourselves and not be dependent, not be dependent upon the Sunday morning experience to fill our tank. That's actually error. It's spiritual error. It's missing the mark. When you have the Holy Spirit, dude, are you kidding me? What? Holy Spirit is in us and we're dependent upon the Sunday morning experience? No, that's not spiritually intelligent. That doesn't make sense. Why? Because Holy Spirit searches all things. And that's why many, many times believers are unfulfilled and not walking in the fullness because they have not understood that I'm not to get everything on a Sunday morning. <sighs> now, the Sunday morning, every Christian who was a member of this church, and I mean, dear God, unless they're out of town and had to be somewhere or something like that, you know what I mean. But outside of that, every seat ought to be full. You see, I, I believe every seat ought to be full. Christians ought to be in church. Are you listening to me? People ought to be here rejoicing. Come on and be here on time. Come on, shout amen and keep looking straight ahead at me, somebody. Come on now. Come on, we won't miss the rolling credits in the movie. If you like me, I don't want to miss because I want to see the stuff before the movie starts. Come on, we ought to be that way about church. We ought to be before they strike up the music. We ought to pump the praise team up. Come on, the praise team ought to come out and say, dear God, these people are ready to go. They, we got we to be able to sing over them so we can hear ourselves. Amen. See, I believe as we spend time with the Holy Spirit, he will help us. He will show you what no man can show you. It is wrong to think of Sunday morning as the day where you get your, listen, here, here I'm saying this. Where you get like your, your word for the week. Now hear how I'm saying it. I got to qualify. Yes, it's the word of the Lord. And yes, you ought to be here. I just spent a few minutes saying everybody ought to be here and be here on time. So you know I'm not contradicting that. What I'm saying is that is not your only source. And I'll say this. You got a better source. Better than me. Better than anybody else who would be your favorite communicator. Way better than them. And he's Holy Spirit. That's why friendship matters. But listen, listen. I, I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to end here. Listen to this. I, I, just want, I just want to submit this to you. What does it mean to be his? To be formed in his likeness. And know that we have a purpose. What does it mean to be his? Again, as I said, most Christians are not currently living their real life. The one that's hidden in Christ, they're not living that. What are they living? The one their mom or daddy told them. The one religion told them. The one that life and circumstances shaped for them. That's the one they're living. The one their high school and lack of college degree told them. The one that lack of a high school diploma told them. The one that culture told them. The one that being single with children told them. Come on now. That's the life they're living. That ain't got nothing to do. That ain't good English. That ain't got nothing. I know it's bad double negatives. But I needed to, that. That's nothing to do with your real life. Because in your real life in Christ, 
There's power. There's strength. There's joy. There's wisdom. There's light. There's love. There's freedom from the bondages and elements of this world. There's victory. There's an ever-increasing, overcoming, triumphing uh, a lifestyle where you're going up and to the right in every area of your life. Oh, it may not be perfect right now, but in Christ, there's a lifestyle where you're going up and to the right every year. You're better than you were the last year, even in practical areas like your money and your, and your marriage and other areas. Yes, he deals with the practical things, but it's hidden in Christ. And it takes Holy Spirit, the search engine, for you to know those things. That's why you want to pray in the Spirit. Amen. It's not about the tongues for the sake of the tongues. It's about searching the heart of God and getting revealed to you so you can live the fullness of what you actually were and stop leaving stuff on the table. The world, this is why this song hit me so hard today. I didn't know they were going to do this one. But listen to this. Listen to that. What does it mean? It means more than what we've demonstrated. What does it mean to be formed in his likeness? A whole lot more than we've demonstrated. Oh, oh way more. Because if you're actually like him, how many know we've not demonstrated all of what it means to be like him? That's not a discouraging word or rebuke. It's an encouragement. It's to say, oh, my God. What is actually available? What have we actually been leaving on the table? And then he says this, all that the church would arise, all that we would see with whose eyes? Jesus' eyes. And then we could, this, they, I, man, whoever, I think it was Israel, man, this song is so rooted in truth and so prophetic and real. When, if all that we would arise and start seeing with Jesus' eyes, how are we going to see with Jesus' eyes when we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal them to us? Amen. Then what will the church do? Show the world heaven. You want a sample? Here's what it looks like. You want a sample of peace? Are you discouraged? Break off some of the fruit of my life. This is what heaven looks like. Come on, what ambassador do you know from the United States that cannot tell somebody in a foreign land what their country is like? What ambassador do you know from the United States that can't give a sample of what it means to be an American? There's no such thing as an ambassador that can't describe to you with explicit detail what it's like to be in America. How is it that citizens of heaven cannot tell people what heaven's like? Because we spend so much time focused on, sometimes, frankly, can, can I keep it 100? I know I can, I'm just saying it anyway, but can I? <laughs> Listen, I, see, I hate saying it, sir, I hate, I, I never come from a critical spirit motivated that way. So I don't mean it in that way, but sometimes as a whole, nobody in particular, as a whole in the church, we've dealt only with superficial things. By that I mean, see, the stuff we're talking about today is weightier things. And they're not the things that make you run and dance and shout and run and all of that right away because it makes you think. But that's the stuff we need to be hearing. Because when you get hit with real life, you need to know there is something to you. And nice, cool, sweet, wonderful things that touch certain areas of our life, that's wonderful. But you need some, some, some substance behind you. Why? So that we can represent well. Just for time's sake, I, I've got to go. Here's what I want you to know at the end of this. Turn the page. God has a million ways to bring you out of a situation. All you need is one. And finally, if you ask once again to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you shall receive. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, once you're born again, you have a new nature. You have God on the inside of you. But the Holy Spirit wants to fill you. Why? Because once I'm saved, I need to be empowered. I need empowerment like my car needs fuel. Come on, somebody. And part of that empowerment, yes, it does impact your prayer life. And every believer, when they're, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. 
till I'm overflowing and empower me. In that moment, you may not feel an absolute thing. It's got nothing to do with your feelings. Right. Not a thing. Amen. And some people may. But it's neither here nor there. It's irrelevant. But Jesus said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Amen. Yeah. I put a story in there that you can... Uh, look at later, and you can come in musicians, they can begin. And it's about a guy named Jacob. And we'll get into this the week after next. About how the Holy Spirit really wants to take us from where we are and really take us to where we need to be and how powerful this is. He worked for a guy named Laban. Some of you are familiar with this story. He worked for him really so that he could marry his daughter and there's a whole long story behind that. Then finally he did marry his daughter and worked for him a little longer. But all the while, the man was cheating him out of increase and promotion and so forth. Finally, Jacob said, I've had enough. I'm out of here. Taking my family, all his wives, and I had a bunch of them. Long story too, won't get into that today. All my children and all my wives, are, we're leaving here. And uh, said, I'm out of here. Laban said, no, wait, 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 wait. Jacob, don't go, don't go, man. Listen, man, my company has been blessed from the moment you got here. I tell you what, Jacob, you name your salary. I'll pay you whatever you ask. Well, Jacob had been with God, see. Jacob had been in a secret place. And the Holy Spirit in a dream had revealed to Jacob a plan on how he could move on and prosper. Jacob said, I tell you what, I don't want to work for a salary. I mean, no, that's a different mindset right there. He said, I want to work on commission. And he told him what his plan was and how he would manage his animals and his sheep and his goats for him. And you can read the story later. But here's what, what happened. At the end of the day, all of the sheep, he said, I'll manage some sheep, they'll be mine, other sheep will be yours, and you'll know them. The ugly, nasty, ugly looking ones, the ones that aren't pretty, those will be mine. Everyone that's smooth and solid and one color, those will be yours. And that way, when it comes time to gather the sheep, you know if I have any smooth ones, you know I've stolen from you. He said, man, that's a good deal. God gave him a plan, and it was such an amazing plan that all of the ugly, spotted, streaked-looking animals, they were the ones that thrived the most. They were the ones that were the healthiest and the strongest and produced the greatest amount of, 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 of their babies were stronger, their bodies were stronger, they produced more of everything that the animal was to produce for them. His was many times stronger than all of Laban's. And as a result, he prospered and prospered more than Laban. Why is that important? Because you see, many of us are in situations where it seems like you're hitting a glass ceiling. You can only go so far. And only, and I'm only designed to go so far. I can't get past this level in my life financially or otherwise. What I just said, God has a million ways to get you out. All you need is one. If Google can come up with 500 million ways for you, pages to tell you how to get out of debt you mean to tell me that God who invented mankind who invented the internet can't tell us of course he can so I encourage you spend time with the search engine let him help you come back to this in a couple of weeks have you been blessed today